sat down with him, you know that to be true. And it reminds me of the verses in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech and in conduct in love and faith and in purity. And that's what Henry's going to do today. He may be young, but he is filled. And I believe anointed. And he is super excited. I know he's ready for me to get out of the way. Um, and we're super excited to have all his family here supporting him. This is, this is what it's about. is encouraging our young people to live for the Lord. Whether it be in ministry, whether it be a doctor, whether it be a teacher, or whether it be anything they want to do to live for the Lord. And that's what Henry's going to do this morning. He's going to live for Jesus. So I encourage you to pray for him. I'm going to pray for him as he comes. You can come on up and get ready. Father in heaven, thank you for this young man. Thank you for his life. Thank you for the calling that you have placed on his life. And Lord, I pray that you would anoint his words, season them with salt, Lord, that you would speak through him in a mighty, mighty way. And I pray, God, that as he delivers this message you have laid on his heart, I pray that we would all be receptive. To what it is you would have us to hear, and that Lord, we would leave here better than what we came. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Dave, for letting me get up here, take his spot just for a week. Um, but uh, does everybody feel like they've been to church yet? Yes. Some of you. Um, <laughs> If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn. We're going to read two passages. The first one is uh, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. And you can put your bookmark there. And the second one is Matthew 16, 24 through 27. But I want to start off lighting the mood a little bit. Now, most people that know me know I consider myself to be a pretty comical person. But I'm more like a spontaneous type thing. But I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to do some prompted jokes, and even if you don't think they're funny, just laugh, make me feel better. Um, so first off, uh, there was a pastor that died and went to heaven, and he was in a long, slow-moving line uh, to the gates where he was greeted by St. Peter, and he noticed that Peter was giving everybody um, a, wood, or a staff, a set of wings, a vehicle, and a robe, but the items were varying from person to person, and so the pastor starts talking to the guy in front of him, and he tells him he was a New York City taxi driver whenever he was alive. And so the taxi driver gets to the front of the line, and the pastor looks, and he gets a, a platinum staff, a silk pair of wings, a, um, what was it, a Lexus, and he's like, well, dang, I must be getting something good then if I'm a preacher. Like, this taxi driver got all that. Well, he gets up in the front, and he gets a wooden staff, a flannel robe, a pair of cotton wings and a beat up Volkswagen. And the pastor looks at Peter and is like, well, what's the deal, man? I was, I was serving God my whole life. And he said, well, he said, you don't understand. We're judging by results. And he said, what are you talking about? He said, I, I read this book cover to cover. He said, it's about putting faith in Jesus. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, whenever you preached, people slept. But whenever he drove, people prayed. <laughs> He loved to ride horses on his free time, and the pastor trained his horse to take off whenever he said, praise the Lord, but to stop whenever he said, amen. So the pastor gets on the horse, cries out, praise the Lord, and it takes off. Well, he gets up after he'd been riding for a couple hours to a nearby mountain, and he says, I'm, I want to stop and take some lunch. So he cries out, amen, the horse stops. Well, after a little while, he lets his food settle. He said, all right, I'm ready to go riding again. So he cries out, praise the Lord, the horse takes off again. Well, he looks off in the distance and gets distracted. And next thing you know, the horse is about to run straight off of a cliff. So the pastor's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then he remembers what he's supposed to say, so he cries out, amen. And the horse stops, like, like a movie scene, where they hit right before you get to the cliff, he stopped. And the pastor was so relieved that he looked up to heaven and cried out, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> that one took me a minute. I didn't know if y'all were going to get that one. <laughs> um, but I wanted to get you laughing because it's a very serious message today. As you can see, it's about being an apprentice of Christ. And I actually got this idea for this sermon from a book a pastor friend of mine gave me. It's called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. And uh, me and Pastor Bun have been talking about that book the last couple weeks. But it really gave me a different perspective on it. But the passage in Matthew 
uh, 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then the NIV, it actually says, who desires to become my disciple. Um, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then the Ephesians passage Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-selling aroma. The quote that I founded this whole sermon on was this, and if you don't listen to I know I talk a lot and chase a lot of rabbit holes, so if you don't get one other thing that I say today, please remember this quote. <clears throat> Contrary to what most people assume, Jesus did not invite people to convert to Christianity Jesus didn't even call people to become Christians, but he invited people to apprentice under him into an entire new way of living, to be transformed. And that was from the book by John Mark Comer. And I pulled up a couple of scriptures that I thought really dealt with that, you know, rabbi, teacher, student relationship. And Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. Then in John 13, right after Jesus washes his disciples' feet, he says, I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Luke 6, 40, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And then the one that I want to camp out on for a minute is Matthew 4, 19. And this is after Jesus calls Simon and Andrew, who were both commercial fishermen. They were working for their dad, had a pretty successful business. And Jesus looks at him and gives him a mic dropping statement. He says, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. That... The come follow me comes from the Greek word akulo theo, which means to accompany one in the sense of discipleship, where one follows a teacher or student as a learner. So you see that Jesus is saying that he wants us to follow after him and apprentice under him. And I got, you know, that's kind of that word. When I read that passage, it makes me think about the word apprentice, because you think about now, you know, we have a lot of apprenticeship programs available for students. It's not because college is bad, but it's because there's different options for people who want to do different things. And apprenticeship programs, they're not just sitting in a classroom all the time, you know, learning and writing down notes and taking a couple standardized tests that determine everything they are. And then they get a degree at the end and they're like, well, what the heck do I do with this? This is, apprenticeship is about them actually learning a skill and then applying it. And at the end, there's some sort of internship or something like that at the end of it. And so you see that that's kind of more what Jesus wants from us. Uh, Jace Robertson said this one time, and I thought this was really good. He said, what Jesus didn't die for was for Christianity to become like a college course, where we set it up and we go to church, we got baptized at 14, we go to church occasionally, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't cuss, therefore we're good to go. That's kind of the way people view it now. But Jesus is saying, you know, you're not going to be perfect, but it's going to become a lifestyle. And it's, it's not like a college course, it's, a, it's an apprenticeship program. We, we saw Jesus. We followed his example, and now we apply it to our own lives. And um, I actually looked this up. I asked ChatGPT what the definition of uh, or how the apprenticeship program worked in ancient biblical times. I thought this was interesting. It said the ancient program uh, for rabbis in biblical times was rigorous and centered around the close relationship between a student, disciple, and their rabbi or teacher. It was more than a formal education system. It was a lifestyle. And I thought that, that describes, you know, Christianity is not supposed to be, you know, we departmentalize our life and it's like, oh, you know, I'm a Christian around these people, but then the rest of the time, I'm, you know, this is the real world. This is how I act in, at work and on the weekends. And Jesus is saying that this should be, your entire life should be formed around this, being an apprentice of him. And um, I thought about this. I, I came up with a quote kind of to describe it. I said, being a Christian shouldn't be a part of your life. It should be your life. Following Jesus should be number one, and everything else should be secondary. Now, he understands we have obligations, but following him should be the priority in our lives. And, you know, I put a, I said, you know, when we follow Jesus sometimes, it seems that people, you know, we have to surrender it all to him. And people feel like it's such a burden for them to just give one hour a week to Jesus, right? They think they, that one hour a week is all that it, that it requires, but it's, it's a lifestyle. And when you follow Jesus... You know, you should crave to be in the presence of God. And it should be something that you, you shouldn't run from. Because when you really have a relationship with him, you can't run from it. 
uh, Psalms 42, 1 through 2 says, Our soul, or it says that as the deer pants for streams of water, my soul thirsts and pants for you, my God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with him? That word, it makes me think of the word yearn, like a strong desire or a longing to be with Jesus. And when you, you look at the world today, it seems that people are longing and yearning for something, but they can't really pinpoint what it is. And you see all these different movements. People are trying to, you know, do all these different things and trying to fill themselves with drugs, alcohol, men, women, whatever it may be. But they don't realize that they have a Jesus-sized void in their hearts. The world uh, pulled up some numbers from the CDC and it said that over 280 million people a year worldwide suffer from depression. And over 700,000 people a year take their own life. We have, and I, I think part of the reason this is because people are searching for identity in all the wrong places. Our identity is found in being an apprentice of Christ this morning. It's not found, now this is going to make some, step on some toes. Your identity is not found in your political affiliation. Ooh, I said that right before November. <laughs> your identity is not found, not even in your family. Your identity is not found in your job. Your identity is not found in your sports team. Can my Panthers fans say amen? We don't have, we don't have that. <laughs> um, but our identity is found in being an apprentice of Christ. And we look at um, that we have a strong desire to follow Christ. And, and our true apprentice should be one that should desire that relationship with Christ more than anything else. And I thought this was interesting. The word disciple is used 270 times in the New Testament. The word apostle is used 80 times, and the word Christian is only used three times. And I think the word apprentice is really a better description of what we are to be, because we're not just learning from Jesus, we're applying it to our own lives. But now, we shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, we talk about what an apprentice is, and what the significance of that word is. Well, now, what does that look like? Well, I, I've narrowed it down to five points of what being an apprentice looks like. And when you look up... Uh, any of the ancient history about what the rabbi apprenticeship programs looked like in ancient Israel, you saw that these people didn't just learn from their rabbi. They lived with them. They learned the Torah, and they studied it and became very well-versed in it so they could then go teach it themselves. And now, you know, what does that look like in 2024, you know, 2,000-something years after Jesus rose from the dead? How do we be an apprentice now in our modern world? Well, the first point of being an apprentice of Jesus is that we must surrender. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said, there's two types of people in the universe. There's a type of people that look at God and say, thy will be done. And there's a type of people that God looks at and says, fine, have it your way. That's, that's kind of a like modern rendition of what he says, you can understand. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's true when you look at the world today. People are either submitted to Christ or they're doing whatever they want to because of their free will. Um, the surrender sounds absolutely ridiculous to anybody in a worldly kingdom in the history of mankind, because how, they didn't get the victory by waving a white flag and surrendering. They gave, they got the victory by winning wars and knocking off all these people that were under them, all the kings that have come before. And the world today teaches that you would not get the victory by surrendering anything. You would get the victory by you becoming a god, you showing everybody how good you are. But this picture is about God in all His glory on the mountaintop coming down and becoming one of you, so that He can teach you what to do. And uh, I, whenever uh, I read the Sermon on the Mount, all I could think of was that Jesus is forming an upside-down kingdom. I mean, that, when you read that passage, you see everything is upside-down from what the world would tell you is good and how you get power. I mean, that's what Jesus was building. The second part is that we must receive the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is the game-changer. Acts 1, 8, it says you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We must receive the Spirit. And when you look at the world today, I think people are giving way too much credit to the powers that be for the things that are going on because it's all about an issue of desire. When you read you know, Galatians and you read about the fruits of the Spirit and the acts of the flesh, you see that the way people are acting today is, is about the issue of desire. It's what, what Spirit is taking residence within them, and you see it by the fruits. Um, People are letting their fleshly desires control their entire life, um, and that seems to be an issue. The culture says, well, just because you have a desire and you, you know, have felt, felt these desires, that means that you need to give in to them and that they're good. But that's not true. We know we have to distinguish between 
the good desires and the bad desires, and we can see that in Galatians. Um, we have to have a, an effort and a willingness to strive for righteousness, but the Holy Spirit is the one that gets the ball rolling for changing your desires. It's, a, it's an inside-out approach, not an outside-in approach. Uh, and I think that sometimes in life we try to play the role of God, and specifically we try to play the role of the Holy Spirit because we go to people that we see are struggling and we say, well, you know, let me help you change. You know, you need to tell these people about Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do the changing because we cannot, we don't have the power to be God. The third point is that we must follow the example. Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the example that we are to follow. The book made a point that said, you know, instead of asking WWJD, what would Jesus do? We should be asking, what would Jesus do if he were me? It takes it a step further, and you see, you know, if, I, if Jesus were me, how would he be acting? That's the way we should build our lives. C.S. Lewis once said, and I think this is another great quote, The church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into, look, into Christ and to make them little Christ. If we aren't doing that, then the cathedrals, the pastors, the missions, the sermons, even the Bible itself are a waste of time. Because God became man for no other purpose. And it's doubtful whether the universe was created for any other purpose. It's about making us into men and women of Christ. And living that out so that we can expand the kingdom. Um, it's about the Great Commission. Jesus said, you know, I've, I've let you this example. I've let you these words. Now what are you going to do with it? You know, he's like, I, I died. I've resurrected. I came back to you. I showed you that I was really alive. Now what are you going to do with that? And that's what we need, you know, we need to ask ourselves today. Uh, 1 John 4, 17 actually says that in this world, we are like Jesus. And that should be the approach that we carry every day of our lives. The fourth point is that we must run the race, whatever the cost. Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And it actually said in John 16, 33, it says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I've overcome the world. It's not a may or a if or a when. It's a when you have trouble. It's a promise for suffering. We learned that from Paul. He talks about how you are going to suffer, but it's how you respond to it. And that's one of the reasons I think I believe the most is because of the eyewitnesses. Not just because it was some men and women that wrote stuff down, but because they were willing to be brutally murdered with a smile on their face for the name of Jesus. And that's how we should be today. You should be so assured of your faith that if somebody were to hold a gun to your head and say, claim Jesus or die, that you would know that you would take that bullet for Jesus. That's, you know, hopefully it doesn't come to that. And we live in a free country, so, you know, hopefully they don't take that away from us. But if it did come to that, you, you need to be willing to do that. That's what Paul was telling us. Um, the fifth point of how we must be an apprentice of Christ is that we must evangelize. Not every, and I came up with this quote, not everybody's called to be a minister, but everyone's called to minister. The book of Ephesians is all about unity and how unity in the spirit, how we all have different roles. We may not look the same, we may not be from the same places, and we may not do the same job, but we all are apprentices of Christ and we have that opportunity. He's called every single one of us, no matter where, you're, no matter where you've been or what you've done or where you're from. Um, get out into the world, preach the gospel to all creation, and be unashamed. And so, closing, we talked about you know being an apprentice of Jesus and what that looks like. And now, some people that you know may have the question, well, why Jesus? Why do we want to apprentice this guy? I mean, a lot of you know you look at different religions; they just say that he was a prophet. You know, he was just some guy that came down and had some good teachings. And most people agree with a lot of what he says, but then they get a little you know some of the stuff gets a little controversial, and they're like, well, I don't know if I can follow that. But most people agree that Jesus was a pretty pretty good guy and he had some good teachings. But why should we be an apprentice of him? What's so special about Jesus? Well, Jesus made it very clear um, who he was. And whenever I studied the I Am statements of the book of John, you, you see that Jesus was saying, I am God. He was making that claim. And they understood that very, very carefully. And that's why they killed him. Um, and, you know, you see now in the world there's a lot of, like, uh, relativism, where they say truth is kind of relative, you know, you, your truth and my truth and his truth and her truth. But Jesus made an absolute truth claim. He said, I'm not a truth, I'm the truth. I'm where all other truth derives from. 
And whenever you translate the words that Jesus is saying all throughout the Gospels, you see that whenever he was saying, I am, you know, he was making the claim that God made in Exodus when he said, I am who I am. Whenever he told Moses, and that's where we get the name Yahweh from, Jesus was making a claim along those same lines. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. And we talked about specifically, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you see that Jesus made sure they understood what he was claiming. He was claiming to be God. He was claiming the truth. And Billy Graham once said that Jesus is either God himself or he's the greatest liar manipulator in the history of the world. And you have to take him for one or the other. He can't just be a good prophet. He has to be one or the other. C.S. Lewis said Christianity, if it's true, is of either utmost importance or no importance at all. But what it can't be is of moderate importance. They understood that Jesus was claiming that they, they take him now for he's either God or he's the greatest liar manipulator in the history of the world. And I believe that he's God. And that's the whole basis of our faith. It says Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that we built this whole, you know, our whole faith around. Um, don't miss Jesus. I'm not, I'm ne not going to be, and I never will be, one of those, you know, hellfire and brimstone preachers up here condemning you, telling you to repent or burn. But I'm going to make this statement. <laughs> there are people that sit in the church for you week after week, year after year, that are going to bust the gates of hell wide open. On judgment day because they miss Jesus and I'm sorry if that's offensive but that's the truth you know it's about Jesus and that's the whole point of this book G Genesis to Malachi is Jesus is coming Matthew Mark Luke and John Jesus is here Acts to Revelation he's coming back get ready the whole point of the Bible is is Jesus um, and I feel that there's people now in the world today maybe even in the church that are letting other areas of their life take the role of God and, you know, whether it be their job or, you know, their family or hobbies or addictions, whatever it may be, they, they may not even realize that it's happening, but it's happening in the world today. People are letting things take the role of God in their lives. And we can't let that happen. God has to be number one and everything else becomes secondary. And once you receive the Holy Spirit, that, that becomes a pretty natural process. We desire the things of God. We must rip the Band-Aid off today and receive Him and become an apprentice. Don't, don't hold it back. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but very true, very few truly want to apprentice Jesus and suffer the way he suffered. When we see Paul, Paul was so in love with Jesus that he said, you know, I don't even know if I want to, if I want to live, I'd rather just go be with Jesus. Paul was saying that he was willing to suffer and he accepted his sufferings with thanksgiving. And another quote from this book, the best path in life and what it really means to be an apprentice is the path of giving up all you are to receive all that God is. Once again, that's not very popular in the culture today. People have defaced what it even means to be a Christian. It's important not to simply follow a religion for outward approval, but to truly apprentice under Christ into a transformed way of life. It's not about, you know, like I said earlier, you're, all of these different things are not going to save you. Your denomination isn't even going to save you, but following Jesus is. It's good that we have all of these different things that we can use to lead people to Christ, but that isn't even going to save you. Um, and this, this is kind of the quote that I think wraps the whole thing up from the book, but it says, The gospel is less about getting heaven into you before, after you die. Or excuse me. The gospel is less about getting heaven, you into heaven after you die and more about getting heaven into you before you die. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was another really powerful statement from that book, and that's true. When we read Jesus, he talks about giving us the Holy Spirit, and now we are to be the church or the body of Christ. We are to be the kingdom now on earth through the Holy Spirit. And I want to give an illustration to close, um, that because we've talked about you know what it means to be an apprentice, what, what that word means, where it came from. We talked about how you do that. And so now I want to close with an illustration I heard. It was by one of my favorite pastors, Cliff Connectly. And he gave this illustration at a wedding because he was talking to the man and woman about how they needed to serve each other no matter what. But whenever I heard this, I thought this was perfect for this sermon. So there was a man and a woman who had been married for about 10 to 15 years. And the husband was a staff sergeant of the military. And the wife worked in an office building as a secretary. Well, she became blind and was really down and depressed about it. It really tore her apart. She said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't do my job. I can't see my husband or my kids. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
And her husband said, you know, it's, we're going to work through this. I'm going to do everything that I can to make sure that, you know, you, you get to work and you do what you need to do. And I'll help you get up in the morning. I'll help you get ready. I'll help you make breakfast. And so he promised that. And so every single day for about a year or so, the husband got up and helped her get to work. And he went in there with her for a little bit. He got to work late so that he could help her get set up. Well, after about a year or so, um, his bosses said, hey, man, we, we're going to need you to, to be at work a little bit earlier. We're, we're falling behind without you. And he, he said, well, you know, we appreciate what you're trying to do with your wife, but we really we need you to be here. And he said, you know, I'll, I'll talk to her about it. And so he went and talked to his wife and said, honey, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to have to start going to work early. You know, I, I know that you can do this, though. You, you know, you, I've taught you. I've helped you. I think you can do it. And he said, let's just try it for a week, and then if you can't do it, I'll work it out. And she said, all right. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, she gets on the bus, no problem, rides the bus up to her office building, gets off the bus, walks up the steps, and when she gets into her building, her coworkers are helping her. And Friday comes around, and the bus driver looks at her and says, you know, you're a really lucky woman. And she, she looked at him and said, you could have fooled me. I'm blind, and I'm riding the bus to work. How could I, how could I be a lucky woman? And she, he looked at her and said, because every single day, whenever you get off that bus, there's a pretty handsome, strong-looking man in a military uniform that's standing right there on the street corner watching your every move, and he does not take his eyes off of you no matter what. And she realized in that moment that was her husband that was there looking after her, watching over her. And that's how we are today with Jesus. We know that he's left us his word. He showed us his example. He's taught us what to do. And now he's saying, you know, how are you going to respond to it? He's, he's stepping back and saying, I'm, I'm still going to send you the advocate, the spirit, but now I want to see what you do with that. I want to see how you get by on your own without me here on earth. And now that's where we're at today. We know that he's always watching over us in this journey of being an apprentice of Christ. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bow your heads. I'm a, I want to say a word of prayer, and then Pastor Dave's going to come up and dismiss us. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for allowing us to be here today. And uh, Lord, we thank you for this message. And I pray that it touches at least one heart in here today, Lord. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that you poured out upon us. And I pray that you'll continue to guide us and fill us with peace and help us to go out into the world and not to departmentalize Christianity. Take it with us everywhere that we go because we have the Spirit of God in us no matter where we are. And we cannot run from your presence, Lord. Please forgive us of all our sins, cleanse us of all our unrighteousness, and be with all those needs that are before us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a round of applause. Isn't that good? And I'm assistant pastor today. It's a good word. I think what I've seen this morning in Henry is what we hope to see as we continue to grow as a church, as we continue to reach out to our young ones and to our, our students and things like that, is pouring into them and pouring Jesus into them, uh, into them. And I've seen that this morning what God can do with a young man uh, who's willing and obedient to serve him. I remember being in his shoes uh, and preaching my first sermon at my home church and he did a lot better than I did. So uh, God's got some big plans for him. He's going to do some amazing stuff through this kid. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I hope that you are looking forward to seeing that as well. I'm going to pray for him. I want you to join me and pray for Henry uh, as he continues to study. He's studying through Liberty, right? Liberty University. And uh, so he's just doing a great job. So let's pray for Henry. Father in heaven, thank you for this young man. Thank you for his life. Uh, and thank you for his obedience, Lord. Uh, to heeding to the call that you have placed on him uh, to preach the word, uh, to be a pastor, to be a shepherd. And so, Lord, I pray that you will continue to prepare him for the role that you have called him to. I pray that you will continue to lead him, help him to navigate each and every season that he will walk through. Uh, the good, the bad, the indifferent, Lord. I know challenges will come. I know there will be times of doubt and frustration. But, Lord, I pray that he would continue to lean in on you. And seek the truth in your word and to trust you as he walks this path that you have laid out for him. Lord, we love you and thank you for it's in your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hey, I just want to kind of say this. I think the, the nugget that I took from Henry's message is we're made for more. <laughs>